So you're making a little over $300,000 a month profit. Well, it's more now. Why are you thinking about your money problems? Get to fucking work. Brought a pair of rollerblades to the club and was like legit sort of got like rolling around. He was In so, the club? so fucking weird. Man. Where did you learn the skills and financial literacy to maintain that wealth without kind of fucking it off? What is going on, you guys? Welcome back to another sit down. Today, I got the boy Cardinal Mason. How you doing, man? Yeah, feeling good, man. <laughs> Great. We just spent like 30 minutes organizing all this here, but we're finally ready to roll. I got him today. We connected the other day because of Jimmy Farley. So shout out to Jimmy if you're seeing this. Shout out Jimmy. But um, yeah, I'm glad to be sitting down with you talking about what you got going on, your background, stuff like that. Yeah, I know man. you've been out here in Miami for a couple of years now, but go ahead and give the people an introduction if they don't know who you are, your background, what you're doing right now. Yeah. So my name is Cardinal Mason. My real name is not Cardinal. A lot of people think that. They like refer to me as Cardinal. They think it's like my first name. So. <laughs> first name is Mason. Um, started uh, copywriting during COVID. Got pretty good at it, helped a lot of people, made a lot of people a lot of money, and then uh, started teaching it. So I still do copywriting, but I focus a lot on like the coaching side of things. It's like, uh, it's just the most exciting thing. It's also the most profitable too, info product. It, it, defi it definitely does make money, but like, it's so much more fun to like do a business like that and like watch like other people make their first 5K than like make my next 5K. Like it just does not fucking make a difference at this point. It's more satisfying, yeah. Way more satisfying. So then um, take it back then to COVID time. I'm gonna assume that you've probably tried other online business models, right? Kinda. I bought a dropshipping course from this guy named Brandon Lewis. You know who that is? I've heard the name. Yeah, I remember I saw, this is when I was at like awareness level zero. Um, and I saw this ad for a guy that like had made 30K in a month on Shopify, which like, I also didn't know that there was revenue, but I saw 30K, I was like, how the fuck mm -hmm. does anyone make 30K in a month, do, like doing anything? And, um, and so I, I think I swiped up and I hit him up and he ended up selling me a fucking hundred dollar course that like was all of my money at the time. Yeah. And so I went through it and I was just like so confused. I was like, dude, like I have to run ads. Like what does that even mean? Like I didn't know anything. Yeah, the barrier to entry seems like it's kind of low for econ, but it's actually kind of high. You got to, you have to learn all these different skills and be able to do all these different things at once. Yeah, I was also just retarded. I, I think like, we all are a little bit. Yeah, I'm, I'm still <laughs> retarded. I, I ended up like asking him for a refund because it wasn't working for me. Really? I, I was one of those guys. Bro, for a hundred bucks? Yeah. Run it back. Yeah, and it was Charge because back. I also thought it was like, <laughs> I also thought it was like, a, like I also thought I could hit him up anytime and just ask him questions. It's like, dude, this guy probably sold like, you know, 2000 copies of this thing. Like he doesn't have time to like talk to me, you know? Mm -hmm. So, okay. Then yeah, you tried that for a little bit, no success there. So how'd you stumble into copywriting then? So I, I was like a child of money Twitter. I know you're saying you're not a big money Twitter guy, but that was like where I was raised. Mm -hmm. And like, there was really only three or four businesses that I talked about on money Twitter at the time. So there was like, you were either like a drop shipper or a freelance media buyer or like an affiliate or a copywriter. And I was thinking like, all right, I know how to write. It seems like copywriting only requires me to know how to write. And I was decent at that. Like I was, I was in a, a, a writing heavy program in, in school, I was in poli sci. Yeah. And so I got into it. Uh, I ended up buying another course and that one was actually good. <laughs> and then I like just, I don't know. I procrastinated a long ass time. Like I just never had like the why. And then during COVID I was like, okay, I've been saying this whole time that I don't have time to do copywriting. Now I have time. I have nothing but time. Mm -hmm. So I did it and I just like it started, you know, working pretty quickly. And to me, that was like insane. I didn't, I wasn't around anybody who like had that kind of mentality or was doing anything with business or anything. Like it was, it was just Normie Central up there in Canada. That's how it is. That's how it is. And then once you start making some money and getting around the right people, things get a lot easier. Way easier, bro. Like that's why I love living here in Miami. Mm -hmm. Cause like you just, you meet everybody who's doing something, you know what I mean? You just get ideas from people. I'm gonna put you on the spot real quick then. All right. What is the number one hook for closing or for some for getting somebody hooked for a high ticket offer? Um, like a hook for what, like a, like a video? An info product. But like, where, where's the hook being hosted? Being posted? Yeah, like, is it um, It'll be video? posted on TikTok. Um, well, there is no one hook. It's kind of a trick question. Um, you the the funnel though goes like you make them aware so it's like the like awareness level one is like did you know you can make money without having to leave your house and you can just do it from your couch you don't need a degree you don't need money and they're like huh that's interesting 
and then you make the business model sound appealing, which it is, at least it was for me. Um, and then you have to sell them on why they can do it. And then you have to sell them on why you are the one to teach them. And then you sell them on your mechanism, which is mine is coaching. Like everyone who joins gets a one-on-one coach. Um, it's daily group calls. They get leads if they're good. So it's not just one hook. You're like you can't just sell anyone with one hook. You gotta, you gotta really draw it out. I wanted to see what you would stir up there. So, but that's a good framework to follow. Yeah. So it's the entire process from the hook to then calling them out, you know, why this is for you and how uh-huh. you can do it. And I'm the solution for you. Yeah. Okay. So then, bro, I want to talk about your, your rise up on TikTok too, because mm-hmm. a lot of your content from the short form that I've seen is a lot more like raw and authentic opposed yeah. to the, the talking head hyper editing. What's the, what's the reasoning behind that? It's, it's mostly just laziness. Like I didn't, I didn't like, okay, when I have an idea for a video, I want to just sit there, hold my phone and make the video. I just want to talk. If I had, if I had an idea for a video and I had to like write it down and then set up a tripod and then film myself and then send it to an editor and then take three days for it to get clipped up and edited. And then it gets back to me and then I can post it. It's not efficient. It's not real. It's just like, it's not the kind of content that I want to make. You can do that. And I have done that. Like I do that with YouTube. Cause like, I want it to be presentable. Mm-hmm. Uh, but with TikTok specifically, I just know that on the platform, you can get away with just like talking shit like you're on FaceTime. You know what I mean? Like a one to many FaceTime. Mm-hmm. And so that's always been the style that I want to do just because it, it, it feels real to everyone watching and it's just the best way for me to get the message across. Yeah, I mean, and just adding on to that, I feel like TikTok, yeah, you can just put out like, the lower quality videos perform better on TikTok for some reason. At least that's what I've seen in terms of production value. And why do you think that is? I don't know. I think like you can make the argument that like because everyone everyone tries and like everyone tries to reverse engineer like what type of content works. Like people people's hypothesis is that on Instagram it has to be more professional, and on TikTok it has to be like less produced, lower quality. But like I don't know. There's no real formula. I think it really does come down to the message, mm-hmm. and like. I don't know like I don't even want to say that I've cracked TikTok because like there are people that I think have cracked it where it's like no matter what they do they will get you know Zach King I know the name yeah he's like a filmmaker yeah. and so like he just knows like and maybe that was just because he was like really early to the platform and TikTok wanted him to like just make a lot of videos so they kept making him viral but every single video he made would go viral that's not the case the case for me like I try shit you know what I mean like I I, I run through different angles all the time just like see what works um, I don't really think there's a formula. Right. I think it, it requires luck. It requires like sometimes just to fucking strike a lightning where it's like you just have this banger idea. You know what I mean? But like once you get one, it is definitely easier to get multiple. Like there are people that are stuck in like the 200 view jail for like life, you know? And there's like not really much you can do about that. Like you could have the best video ever and it might only get like a couple thousand views. I don't know what it is. I have no idea. That was actually one of my questions I wanted to ask you was like, because you've gone viral for like several times. I wanted mm-hmm. to see like, is there some sort of method for that for the algorithm or what? But you just explained it like you're just testing and seeing what's working and seeing what people actually like. So, yeah, I mean, my so the, the case for me was I started posting videos on a new account on Cardinal Mason. I had two videos that I posted that did pretty well. Um, like right off the bat, like I was never in 200 view jail. Like my first two videos, I think. I posted them and then I woke up and they were at like 15,000 views each. And I was like, huh, okay. And so I just kept making more. And then I was making so many videos. I had one that got to like five point something million, like my fifth video or something like that. And then I think the way that like people will see, and also like my shit was new at the time. Like no one had really seen content like that. Now you see a little bit more like talking head style, like about business or about money. Um, but people would see that big video and then they'd go to my profile to see like what else was going on. Cause it was, like I said, it was so new. Like no one knew it was, that was a thing yet. And then, um, I think when people like are, are watching a video and going, Oh, who is this guy and viewing your channel and following you and like just engaging with you for a long time. Um, it makes it easier to just go in the algorithm. But again, this is all a guess. Like I, I'm not going to lie when people in my like real life, like there's a couple people that like want to crush content and they'll like ask me for advice and dude, I never know what to say. 
I have no fucking idea, bro. Like, it's so random. It requires so much luck, and it requires, like, the right type of personality and, like, the right type of video for the right type of audience. Like, I wish I could, like, create some sort of, like, formula for TikTok, but there just really is none, bro. Okay, then, right now, if you were to start a new brand from scratch or a new personal brand, what platform would you start on? I would still probably start on TikTok. And I think the right way to do it is you use TikTok as like a testing ground for like f sort of farming viral content and then posting on Instagram. Um, but Instagram is a way better platform than TikTok mm -hmm. to, for business. Mm -hmm. Like, cause you have so many more tools. Like you have, and also like when someone follows you on Instagram, it means more than when they follow you on TikTok. Like That's I have, so I have half a million followers on TikTok. You would think that I would get like half a million impressions on everything I post because that's how many followers I have, but I don't. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? On Instagram, you have like some sort of safety net where it's like, no matter what I post, like this many people are gonna see it, mm -hmm. guaranteed. It doesn't work that way. Like you have a million followers on TikTok and get like 10,000 views a video. Yeah. Do you think in the next few years that like that TikTok platform or TikTok itself will be the best platform or are you just gonna pivot to see what, wherever the viewers are going, you'll pivot to? I, th I think Instagram is still king. Yeah. Um, I wish I had, you know, half a mil on Instagram instead. Like I'd be doing like two mil a month. Yeah. Um, I don't know. TikTok's cool. It's just like it's just not a good place to like build a brand unless you're just like a get ready with me influencer, like mm -hmm. or Alex or all. Like if it's literally just to look at you and you don't have to like you know push any traffic anywhere else. Like I feel like TikTok is good for that. Like just making fucking videos and that's like kind of what I've started to do. Like I'm relying on it less for business mm -hmm. and I kind of just make videos about like what what I want to talk about right now. What are you most focusing on? I know you're not big into crypto, but are you still dialing in? Dude, I wish I was big into crypto. <laughs> can, you, can you teach me some crypto shit? Of course, of course, of course. I was actually going over a lot of stuff uh, with some of, uh, some of the other guys on the boat yesterday, mm -hmm. and we're all just geeking out on it. But yeah, of course. Ready to throw money in the market right now, or what? Or waiting yeah. for a pullback? No, I'll, like, yeah, no, I, I don't know what to look for. Like, I don't know if, like, I should be waiting until, like, something else happens. But, like, I'm willing to throw down, like, quarter mil. Yeah. See what happens. Okay. Well, I'll give my thesis on stuff briefly uh, on camera. So I'm a big believer in the gaming infrastructure. Okay. Um, I'm not a gamer myself. I used to be, I used to play Call of Duty like 12 hours a day when I was like 15, 16, okay. like yeah, trick shotting yeah. and shit and sniping. <laughs> All right. Um, but the reason I'm so bullish on that is because so many big guys and like the YouTube community are talking about it, but also the whole future is moving towards augmented reality ai and i'm not gonna particularly invest in a specific gaming token but i want to invest in the gaming infrastructure where games will be built on top of that token so it's more sustainable and i'm not just betting on one singular game i'm betting on the entire backbone that's going to power the games to, to function right so i think that's just going to blow up over the next few years it already has been uh, since the beginning of this new cycle and so many people these days, especially guys, are going to be settling for a, a depressing life, which is going to be wearing VR and bullshit. Yeah. And um, if we can kind of make money off that in the most conscious way possible, yeah. then why not position yourself in the right way? That's like a Harvard educated like hypothesis as to why you're going to make money. Dude, what kind of butt coin, what kind of like ass coin can i fucking like you know what i mean like Some dog token. And me. yeah. yeah like how do i make like what didn't dog and me go up like 50x or some shit like that what doge no, it's it's called dog and me dog and i never even heard of that that's how many shit coins there are bro yeah there's i'm surprised so many. you didn't hear about it that was like you know dog and me i don't know man fuck I, there's too many of them yeah. we were talking about some other ones last night too at dinner when i was at woody but Dude, there's too many to try and keep up. The meme coins is where some of the craziest returns are, as you know, obviously. Like, people be getting, like, 20Xs overnight. I know. It's but ridiculous. My, my trading strategy, my investment strategy isn't really anything like that. I'll throw a few bands to something super risky, but typically, I'm aiming for, like, a, a 10X, 8 to 10X in my portfolio. And if something else can kind of carry to the higher end of that, then let's run it. But there's, I'd rather be a little more safe with, the capital that I'm playing with because just as fast as it can go up, it can go down. Right. Um, Which you never see. Exactly. Twitter. Like no one ever posts about, and that's why I feel such FOMO right now is because no one ever talks about like, yo, I lost like 500 K on 
yeah. XYZ coin. You know what I mean? Yeah. People are just posting like their portfolio screenshot, but just because they're doing that doesn't mean they're taking profits. I know. But there's been so many people that run up like a couple million dollars and they write it back down. Like, that's got to be the worst feeling. I bet. <laughs> yeah. But I, that's also important why you have to have a cash flowing business. Mm-hmm. So that's what I always tell people. And like, I, I did a podcast with a trader, like a day trader recently. Okay. Shout out Cam for that. Um, and I was saying like, everyone talks about like how like it's like different business models like compete with each other it's like i think you should have both like i think you should have some sort of thing that's like a cash flow play and some sort of thing is an equity play equity or i guess long term yeah. sort of like moonshot type gains For sure. where it's like if you're a trader it makes sense to like have some sort of thing like high ticket sales or copywriting to like have that in your pocket so you can make an extra five ten grand a month mm-hmm. while you are trying to you know ride a bull, bull run or something like that yeah, for sure for sure and in terms of investments how many Rolexes do you have? How many Rolexes? Yeah. Okay, so I have the Chocolate Day Just. I have the Gold Prezi. I have the Platinum Prezi. I have this Prezi. And then I have the John Mayer. And then I have a Sub. And then I have an AP. Okay, so seven luxury watches. Are these for investment purposes or just for fun? They hold money. Like, I also, I love watches. Like, I love wearing, I wear all of them. I like, it was, like, I try and give everybody, like, fair playing time. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I technically have one for like every day of the week, but I don't do that. I never wear the fucking sub. I like this one. This is my favorite right now. It's the the um, the Sundust like diamond baguette bezel or uh, dial, which is really cool. I love the platinum one, and then the the gold Prezi is like my fucking fave. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I just I just love them. Like I think they're sick. Like, okay. But I mean, it's not an investment. Like I don't expect any of those to like go up fucking ten x. You know. It's just, it's like just, you said, the park money and something. Yeah. I have like. Five percent of my net worth in watches. <laughs> Slight flex. Then okay, I, I want to. I just thought of this right now because I was listening to a podcast from uh, I forget who the hosts were, but you mentioned a really cool story of how you were on a yacht with Tom Cruise. Is that right? That would have been like October, November. I can't remember why we did that yacht, but him and his boys pulled up. Yeah. Wait. Sorry. What was the question? No, I was, I was gonna say like, how did you meet Tom Cruise on the yacht? Like, how did that how that even come to be a thing? Okay, so I made a TikTok like over a year ago now where it was like the different levels of money about how like at 5K you get this, at 10K a month you get this, 20K a month you get this. He made the same video and then someone posted it on Twitter. They were like, yo, this guy stole your fucking um, like t- TikTok. And I was like, oh, that's, that's weird. So I went to TikTok to see who it was and it was Tom Cruise, the Section 8 guy. And I was like, oh, I love him. Like, I don't give a fuck, it's Tom Cruise, like whatever. And I realized he followed me, so I followed him back and then I was hitting him. I was like, yo, dude, like, great TikTok. I love you. <laughs> and he was like, yeah, thanks. And then um, he moved down to Miami. And I, I like, uh, he texted me. He was like, yo, I'm in Miami now. I'm like, okay, cool. Like, here's my number. Text me. And we were texting back and forth. And then I, like, on my balcony, like, took a picture of him. Because he lives right over there. Mm-hmm. Or lived. And, um, and so I took a picture of him. And I was like, is that you, bro? I just sniped you. And then um, one time, like, he was he had a free night. And so, like, me, Ben, and my younger brother Griff, we got picked up in his uh, in his double R, and he took us. Uh, we were supposed to go to dinner, but I think we went we went to like uh, one hotel bar, okay. and then we ended up going to. It was like a whole night, bro. It was like a weird fucking night. Like we went to Bagatelle, and there was this, like this guy that like bought us a table, and he was like sixty five, and he was like some definitely like one of the girls when we met her sugar daddy, and he like brought a pair of rollerblades to the club and was like legit swear to god like rolling around he was in so the club? so fucking weird bro <laughs> it was so weird and then tom ended up going home with like the, the baddest chick that we were with so yeah it's pretty cool yeah bro walked off in the sunset with a betty no yeah <laughs> and, and drove us all home in the fucking in the rolls royce yeah <laughs> yeah he was he was daddy that night i'm not yeah. gonna lie he was balling out for you guys yeah no he's cool man and like he's someone that i look up to because like he's built like real wealth with something that doesn't require his face mm-hmm. and like i've said multiple times that like i can't wait until i'm kind of done with what i'm doing now because i i'm there's a lot of people that need to be impacted still and there's a lot of people that we need to teach how to make fucking money mm-hmm. and i also want to you know make hay while the sun shines uh, and once that's done i will not have a personal brand anymore i'll probably leave my instagram at least my cardinal mace instagram I'll probably leave my tiktok probably keep my newsletter but like i don't ever want to have to make money with my face ever again I want to be able to do what he's doing, which is like some sort of business, real estate, where like he doesn't need to fucking turn on a camera and yap in order to make money. 
So like that's something I mean I'm looking forward to. I think like and also section eight like if I'm not an idiot, I could start now and be him in five years. Mm-hmm. Which by him I mean like like hundred mil. Mm-hmm. So it's I'm, crazy. There's a lot of money in the section eight stuff, real estate in general, but mm-hmm. specifically that. Did every like super rich guy that I've been connected with down here, except for a few who just have like ridiculous family money, they're doing some sort of real estate. Yeah. It might not be like the main way that they make money, but they have a ton of real estate and it's like a big part of like how they earn. So like that to me is exciting. Yeah, I mean, even the guys back at home in, in Scottsdale, uh, Seb G for example, he's big in real estate mm-hmm. and he's just actually getting a house remodeled right now. He's gonna live there for a little bit and then he's just gonna rent it out. Mm-hmm. I've been following that, him talking about that for a couple of years. He's been working on that for a minute. And so this is actually a different house. Oh, a different one? His main house isn't even finished being built yet. Fuck, seriously? Yeah. Oh my God, I was gonna say like, the thing I like about how Sebastian does real estate is that he does it with like a vision behind it. Like he's not just trying to make money. He obviously will make money, but like he's thinking like, yo, if I, if I could build an empire, like he wants to have like the fucking skyscraper with the G on it Yeah. for like, I don't know, hundred million, which like is not that crazy. Like he makes it sound very attainable. Um, and then like, sometimes I look out on this skyline over here and I'm like, damn, like one of those could be mine mm-hmm. one day if I really want to. That actually brings me to a point I wanted to bring up. Since you moved down here, right, from Canada, right? Mm-hmm. How important has been positioning yourself with the right people been in your life for you to have that mental breakthrough uh, and perception being shattered before? Yeah, I think like I found a really good balance of having friends that are doing cool things and are making money, but they're not like, I'm not throwing caution in the wind on like who they are as a person and just only chasing down like the richest friends I can. There's a handful of guys around here that are younger than me, like 19, 20, who are printing two mil a month profit. And I could be friends with them probably, but I don't fucking want to. Like they're just like human pieces of garbage. And so I just don't want to, I just don't want to associate. My friends are all crushing. I don't, I don't think I have a single friend who makes less than like, I don't know, three, four hundred K a year, which like may not sound that crazy, but like, dude, fucking nobody anywhere else around, like around our age is yeah. touching that's that. Not a thing. Yeah. Like my close circle, like they're all in the, in the seven figures a year. Mm-hmm. Like we're all doing big things together. And like, they're all just solid quality people. Like Jimmy, for example, absolute gem. You know what I mean? Ben, gem, cam, gem. Like everyone, everyone that I hang out with is like someone who makes me better in a lot of ways, mm-hmm. not just financially, mm-hmm. because like that is important. But I also know that like, I'm not trying to like sprint as hard as possible to like get as rich as possible now. Like I work hard yeah. and I know that I, that will happen, but I also understand that like, dude, I'm 25 or 24, I'm turning 25. And like, I have three, four decades to make the impact that I wanna make. Yeah, the marathon mindset is something that a lot of guys, even myself, honestly, kind of push away. Mm-hmm. Cause you just try and get it right now, right now. Cause we want something right now. Mm -hmm. But it's good to have that longer term mindset. And that's when I think even stuff like real estate comes into play. That's a long term game. Yeah. For guys that are just trying to run up a bag right now, like real estate makes no sense. You know what I've learned? I've learned that every single time I think something's done or I think I've tapped out an opportunity or I've made as much money as I think I'm going to make, something else comes up and it changes the way I think about it. Where it's like with copywriting, when I first started, I was like, dude, how the hell am I going to sustain this? Like, how am I going to keep finding clients for like the rest of my career, like the next 10 years? And then I saw that that was like, dude, there's a million people that want to work with me or work with a copywriter that I could get. Mm-hmm. And then the agency. And then like, the, you know, another product that I had that I don't work on anymore. And then another thing, like the thing that I have now where it's like, I always think it's over. I always think that like, if I don't crush this one opportunity, I won't have another one. We get infinite shots on net. Mm-hmm. And I, I basically imagine, anytime I'm feeling like that, I just imagine that like my, my 75 year old self who has a fucking hundred million dollar crib in West Palm, or not West Palm, regular Palm Beach, because that's where the rich people are, like an ocean boulevard, yeah. comes to me and says, yo, no matter what, you're gonna make it, do your best every single day, and you will be me, guaranteed, you cannot fuck this up. Like, it doesn't matter, like, you might make an extra couple mil in the next couple of years if you like really, really push, but no matter what, you're gonna be worth like nine figures by the time you're me, 75 year old Mason. And like this, now that I'm saying this, it sounds like an Alex Ramosi thing, but it's different. It's not like, 
it's not like the nothing matters thing it's like the like you just keep doing what you're doing like it's gonna fucking work out you know what i mean and so like sometimes i talk to 75 year old mason he just tells me like dude like you're good don't worry dude that's such a common mentality of all the guys i talk to uh, in terms of having a, a higher version of themselves the person they can kind of step into to become you are kind of talking to yourself from an older per perspective but uh, a different way how i'm kind of uh taking this in is how like you see the traits you see the qualities of your 75 year old self what that individual has and now you're stepping into that and you're adapting those characteristics and personality traits and playing the long game and understanding mm -hmm. where you're going you're not in a rush and it's a really good healthy mindset because so many people are just in scarcity like right now right now type action mm -hmm. and when you kind of put things in perspective it's kind of a little more relaxing like I, i'm all for pushing really hard right but there's certain certain times where it's not benefiting you and you're actually stressing yourself out more than you should be yeah. because as you mentioned at a certain point when you have a certain amount of momentum bro opportunities will just keep throwing themselves at you and you only need to hit a few of them if you win one percent in life and you try 200 different things throughout your life no matter what age you are right now you're going to mathematically have uh, your math you're mathematically going to have luck and, and and do well in at least two different things Mm -hmm. And those things could be moonshots. It could be crypto, for example. It could be some crazy meme coin you catch. Yeah. Or it could be a skill you learn, like copywriting, where you actually acquire your first client, build it up from there, and then actually go turn it into something bigger than that where you're impacting a whole bunch of people in life. So you mentioned something a few moments ago, too, when you were just starting out in the mentality of like, oh, how am I going to get my first... Uh, how am I going to get more clients and sustain this, right? Mm -hmm. What's the story of how you brought on your first ever copywriting client? Um, yeah, so I, like I said, I, I, I had been thinking about copywriting for a long time. Mm -hmm. Like I procrastinated for way too long. Like I, I started, I learned about it end of 2018. I let all of 2019 go by just doing research, which like a lot of beginners get stuck in that phase and I didn't have someone yelling at me on TikTok to tell me that that's not okay. Mm -hmm. And so I was just like, dude, this is perfect. Like I'm just preparing myself and then I just, I was just like, I was way too long. It was 18 months almost wow. before I, before I like actually did anything. COVID hit, um, finished my, you know, semester of school that I was in online. And then I ended up, um, I tried like a bunch of different things. I was first trying to get like a copywriting job. Um, like there was like this job board that I saw that I thought would like, that, that was like the magic fucking bullet. It wasn't, there wasn't really anything that I saw on there. I ended up getting this one gig that was like writing articles for like this music blog. And it was like 15 bucks for a thousand words, which is slave labor, bro. Absolute slavery. Okay. And so I never even got paid for that. <laughs> um, and then, cause I wrote two articles and then she just never paid me. Um, and it was like eight hours of my life, but it was, it was whatever. And then I realized I was like, all right, if I'm gonna actually make money, the money that I wanna make with this, like I'm gonna have to go direct to the, the founders, direct to the brand that I wanna work with. I can't have them looking for a job. Cause if they're looking for a job, my resume fucking sucks. Like I'm a 20 year old kid at the time with no degree, no experience, and no idea how this fucking works. Yeah. But if I go direct to them, and they don't even know that they're looking, and if they, that's how they're probably gonna find me, right? So I, um, uh, I started sending cold emails. I would just like scroll Instagram, find brands. Mm -hmm. I would click on their thing, see if they had a newsletter. I would sign up, and then I would screenshot their thing, and then I would go and try and find the email of the founder for that brand it was very complicated product. there's way easier ways to do it now but that's how I was that's how I like figured it out at the time mm -hmm. um, and then um, and then I, I think I sent 65 cool emails and on my 65th one it was every, you know Everyman Jack that brand yeah the soap yeah the soap yeah the shampoo yeah. so I was I was like I signed them and so I got on a call and I closed them it was just like an hourly project okay. uh, as a freelancer and I got, I got lucky because they actually were looking, but they hadn't put out the job post yet, but I just hit them up. And it was like perfect timing. And then after I got that one two days later, or something like that, I sent a DM to an agency owner. You know Chase Diamond? No, I actually don't. I, agency owner, like they do eight figures now, his, his agency. And, um, and I hit him up and I said, hey man, like I, I know you're looking for a copywriter, like I would love to help out. I'm not super experienced, but I will work, I will outwork everybody. And I did. And so I ended up working with them for a long time too. And once I had those two clients, like Ironman Jack and the agency, 
it gave me all the confidence I needed to just like do like whatever it took to get the next you know 10k. Awesome. I personally had never heard that story before, so that was that was awesome. It's just people think sending like 10 cold DMs a day or 10 cold emails a day is enough. It's but not. We not have anymore. we have somebody on our team for processing, and they send they were sending around half a million emails a month. Yeah. And only sending on weekdays, not the weekends or holidays. Um, they were from the ERC world, so they're used to that sort of outreach. Mm -hmm. And at that sort of like volume, the amount of calls being booked every day was like eight to 10, sometimes 12 new leads that were qualified. Mm -hmm. So it's just all about turning up that volume and finding the people you actually want to work with that are qualified. And from there, it's not the hardest thing to close them because if they're already interested at least to talk to you, they're at least one foot in the door at least. Mm -hmm. So I want to go uh, into a little bit more about your copywriting stuff. So what was the biggest copywriting gig that you closed before? Um, okay, well, my biggest retainer was this brand called Lunya. Mm -hmm. And they were an e-commerce brand. I think at the time they were doing really well. And I hit up the creative director on LinkedIn without even looking for a gig. Like I just told them, I was like, I don't know who your copywriter is. Um, but you guys are fucking dope. Like, I love everything you put out. Like, whoever your copywriter is, let them know. Like, they're, like, you know, number one. Um, and the the lady who ran that department was like, thank you. Actually, like, we're looking for more writers. So if you want to be in, like, let me know. And so I think that was, like, a, a it was, like, a $5,500 a month retainer that I got, which, like, at the time was big for me. Mm -hmm. It was just a lot of work. Like, I was, I was in there a lot, bro. It was, like, I was, like, I was basically a part of the team. Like, I got invited to their fucking team Christmas party. <laughs> That's awesome. It was sick. It was all it was all on Zoom, but it was whatever. But the biggest actual thing that I did as a copywriter was it was a rev share project with Chase. So the reason Chase is kind of like my it was like my mentor because I worked for his agency, but like he wasn't really involved in the agency. Like he was just doing lead gen, and I told him I was like, dude, like if you ever need help, like writing tweets or writing your newsletter, or writing press releases, writing anything to help you like get more leads, like I'll help you write it. I'm a copywriter, I know how to do this stuff. And he was like, huh, okay, because no one had ever done that. It was like a job, you know what I mean? Like no one's ever like hitting up the CEO of their company saying like, hey, let me help you build your personal brand. No one does that, especially back then. Like, so um, he, would, he trusted me to like ghostwrite a lot of his stuff. And then we ended up launching a course together um, I did basically all of the like fulfillment, like I created the course and then he sold it. And so I got a chunk of that. Okay. And that was why I hit those two massive months, like in 2021, 48K, like basically back to back. I think it was like October, November, mm -hmm. because like we dropped this thing and it just printed and I got a, a chunk and he paid me well. And so that was, that was solid. It was in the f five figures. Like it was probably, I don't, know, I don't know exactly what it was, but it was a lot. I mean, that's a huge breakthrough for someone at the time. What were you, 21? Yeah, or 22. 22, still yeah. incredible. Two months back to back like that. Yeah, it was crazy, bro. Yeah, I mean, now too, I recently saw a TikTok of you breaking down uh, your spending habits oh, over last boy. year, bro. Yeah, let's talk about that. <laughs> yeah, I think that that is honestly like a record or a damn near record for people that are our age for the most part. From spending your personal like expenses, yeah. there were definitely a couple like business expenses that snuck on there, but okay. like, it wasn't like I wasn't putting payroll on there. Like that was like, like some of it like we wrote off because it was like a, a jet, for example. Like we like we took a jet to Tampa, and that was like expensive, and that's probably a business expense. And like for some sure. other shit where it's like probably a business expense, but like that was mo that was all my personal spending. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because it was around like fifty k a month, right? On average. No, it was like. Did you see the? the Amex statement or maybe it was 50 no it was it was 970 for the year thousand for the year <laughs> which like averages out to like 75 racks a month I forget what month I was looking at them but that's still absurd you're probably talking about the other pod that I did where I talked about my spending was I was wrong I didn't know exactly what it was until I looked at the numbers it was actually higher so yeah no it was around uh, just just under a million last year in personal spending okay. at what point do you believe that earning a certain amount of money becomes redundant. You mean like, when, when does it stop mattering? Yeah, just like diminishing returns. I don't think it ever does. Really? I think like, especially at this age for me, like the bigger the nest egg I can stack, the better. Mm. An extra $100,000 a month still matters to me. And we're pushing for that, you know what I mean? So like if I can, like, if I can net 
I don't even want to. I don't know if I was saying, but like, <laughs> like if you're if you're spending, let's just let's be super generous and just say you're spending fifty grand a month on your lifestyle. That's a very good life. Yeah, you're doing really well, um, and you're making one fifty net right after taxes. Yeah, you're saving a hundred, and so after a year, you'll have an extra one point two in the bank that like you don't have to touch. You can put that somewhere, mm-hmm. but like an extra hundred on top of that at the end of the year is another million. You know what I mean? So like, even if I don't spend more on my lifestyle, which I probably won't, it just equals more comfort for me. And that has always been why I want to make money. Like I've, I've never really cared about being like super, super rich. Maybe more recently where, cause it's like now I see it as possible. Like I, I probably could get to like a hundred mil by the time I'm, you know, in the next decade. But when I started, like the only thing that I, like my magnum opus was like, I just want to have half a mil in the bank. Like, I just want to have that yeah. because like I can put a down payment on a decent house in Canada. I can have like three years of like generous living expenses and then a hundred grand for like whatever I want. You know what I mean? If I wanted, if I just need it, I just have it. And that to me was like, if I had that, that's all I need. And then make like 20 racks a month. That would have been like my dream lifestyle. Then I realized that you can do a lot more. Um, and so like, I just, I, but I just crave that security. Like I want to be financially untouchable which like I'm getting very close I think in the next two years I'll probably be in a position where it's like if I don't actually want to work I don't have to mm-hmm. but I do because I want to keep going at what dollar figure per month was it sort of like life changing for you where you could buy the cars you want or do buy the watches I should say that you wanted mm-hmm. live where you wanted what was that dollar figure well I, I've been making like over 100k a little over 100k a month since like September I think of 22 and then it wasn't until May of 23 where I cracked like I started netting like 300 Um, and then at because that was when everything started to just take off Mm -hmm. like everything that I was working on just like was in perfect harmony it was just like okay we're going Um, that was when I was like whoa like this is way more than I need and it was that's that okay so I don't know if you saw that TikTok I made where it's like the four levels of money no, go into that, please. Okay, so you have, you have, you start at comfort, right? Or sorry, you start at scarcity. Scarcity is when you don't, you're, you're basically right on par with like, you make 3K a month, you spend 29.80. You're so fucking close to the edge, you don't have any savings. Comfort is the second level where it's like you make 10K a month and you spend three. That gap is super comfortable. Mm-hmm. Um, and then that can go up. It's more of like a percentage thing, right? But it's like, I think scarcity is obviously like under like 5K a month. Comfort is like between 10 and like 30K a month. I would say the next level after that is abundance. So you get to 50K a month. And then you're probably, if you're smart, you're not going to spend more than like 10, 15, maybe 20K max on your, on your like lifestyle. Yeah. And then so you have a big chunk of cash that you can spend. You 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 have abundance. You can buy nicer things. You don't really have to pay attention too much to what you're, you know, spending money on. I would say that's like between like fifty and maybe like one fifty or two hundred. Beyond that is excess. Tom Cruise lives in excess. Tom Cruise has a fucking hundred and twenty foot yacht. Tom Cruise has a twenty million dollar crib in in Miami, where like he has a fucking elevator from his garage with seven insane luxury supercars up to his third story where his fucking 2000 square foot master bedroom is that to me is is excess i am bordering on it depends on the month honestly but like it's like high abundance low excess obviously excess is like it goes on forever like there's a million levels of excess where it's like some people make they net 12 million a month that's very possible there are people that do that like this the ceo of OnlyFans makes like fucking 700 million dollars a year it's like two million a day. That's for him. He pays himself that. He'll pay taxes on it. He doesn't give a fuck. That's excess. He doesn't know what to spend it on. And you know what? He earns it because <laughs> like he's worked, man. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I realized that I was like bordering on excess when I started hitting that, like 300. And then I was like, okay, this is like where life just, it, it was way different. It was and it was the most exciting period. There was like from May to like July was when I was just like, whoa, fuck, bro, holy shit, where because I was I wasn't adjusted to it yet. My income like basically four x, like my personal take on four x. It was already decent, mm-hmm. 
And so I was like, damn, all right. Like, now I can get creative with how I want to spend this shit. And I started being stupid, but whatever. When you started blowing up your online business, making around 300 grand a month profit, where did you learn the skills and financial literacy to maintain that wealth without kind of fucking it off and just building your businesses while exploding your income? Right. So I have like this double problem where like, I'm actually not super financially literate. Like I've always been a little bit irresponsible with money. Like even when I had none, like I was making three racks a month as a server and I was still finding a way to spend all of it because like I didn't want to really sacrifice anything. I, and that's never really changed. Um, so I have that, but I'm also like a bit of a bitch when it comes to spending money where it's like, there's a hundred, like there's so many things that I could afford that I just like mentally am not able to get over. Like I just feel like a little bit of a brokey. What's that? Give an example. Cars. Well, it, t- it's ma- it makes it tough because like I can't even really get cars down here because I'm not American yet. Mm. So I can't even buy a fucking car, technically. So I just like import it from Canada. <laughs> um, and um, like, I don't know. Like, just like, just, I don't know. Like, I'm trying to think. Like, I mean, no, that might be cap because I do spend a lot of money. I, like, I've, I've started flying private very frequently, That's which fun. like I only started doing because there's another guy that we know who is around the same level as me, and he never flies commercial. He only ever flies, at least when he's flying domestic, mm-hmm. he only flies private. Mm-hmm. And I just started flying first class everywhere, like beginning of last year. And then like end of last year, I started just like, all right, well, like I have a jet guy, and I've probably spent like quarter mil in the last like five months on jets. Just on PJs. Yeah. So like, but I also know my numbers. I know my limitations. Like I know what I'm not going to do. I also avoid myself getting into fucking debt. I'll do like one time big purchases. Like I'll get like a big table or I'll get a a jet, but like I'm not, I I probably wouldn't buy myself a crib right now Mm -hmm. and have like a, like that kind of freaks me out. Like a 30 K a month mortgage payment would freak me the fuck out, Mm -hmm. even though it would be no problem technically. But I just, for some reason, I think like, fuck, if this, if the music stops, if all my shit, all the, all the businesses I'm working on stop now, I would be, I, I would be humbled, which is actually my biggest like fear. Yeah. It's that overhead. I was mm. talking to somebody else earlier who's, who's pretty big in the space and they were saying that they're just getting finished paying their student loan debt and they hate it because you have that constraint. It's like, it's like a weight tied to your ankle mm. and you can't, you can't cut the weight off uh, until you get done paying it. And I think taking on any sort of loans at this point is foolish for any of us right now, mm-hmm. especially when we're in a bull market right now. <laughs> so I, I paid my, that was one of the first things I did when I started making money. I wiped out 18 grand worth of student debt. And like, I think it took me like five or six months, mm-hmm. but that was like my biggest thing. Mm-hmm. Cause that, now I was still living at home. I, I deleted Uber Eats off my phone. Um, I was like driving a regular car making decent money. I was just like, I got to wipe this fucking student loan out. Mm -hmm. And I did. And so like the first thing I did, and then I wasn't, I wasn't even going to move out of my, my parents' house until I wiped that out. And so that was, I sprinted to that because I hate debt too. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be like, just light. You know what I mean? Like, I guess I I had a a car lease Mm -hmm. and I have loans now on cars, but like there's nothing. I, I won't take on a loan. That's like super uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Like I'm even like, here's another example. Everyone thinks supercars are like really expensive and they are like you look at the the MSRP and they are expensive, but as long as you can afford the down payment, the monthly payment is not that much. Mm -hmm. So if you're, if you're a three or a third or fourth year entrepreneur, you should at this point know how to make a hundred K a month net. You should be able to do that. And so what that means is like you can put down a hundred K or 150, maybe a little more. Um, and, uh, on a, on a fucking SF90, which is like a $650,000, $700,000 Ferrari, yeah. and make the payments for like four grand a month. That's a big boy car. Like you can get it, you can get like a Brokey Lambo, which is like a Huracan, or you can get like even like a base model fucking Aventador, or like a McLaren. Those are like, like all those cars under 300K, you see a lot, like especially in Miami, like see fucking flying in a, like, like a Urus or a fucking G Wagon or a Range Rover. Every single corner they're on. Exactly. But like an SF90, you don't see. Cause they're big boy cars, but most people who are in your, their third or fourth year of business could afford that. I can afford that right now. Um, but that for some reason it still trips me out where it's like, uh, I don't know about that. You know, it's a certain level of liability. At yeah. The end of the day. Yeah. And so, yeah. And it's just like the number scares me. Mm-hmm. I'm just a little bitch when it comes to spending money. 
I get it, chill. Waves in it, as you said. There's waves of where you'll drop a bag, but then you're also responsible at the same time without inflating your lifestyle constantly. Yeah, like right now, okay, so this place I'm in right now is like not my forever home, obviously. Like yeah. it's like temporary until I get my visa. Mm-hmm. And when I do get a visa, my plan is to get, like there's a building over there um, and there's a penthouse for like, I think it's like 17 grand a month. And I was thinking like, that would be sick because I could afford that and I could have like a probably the nicest crib that like I've I don't know anyone else with a fucking 17 grand a month penthouse oh yeah out of the whole squad yeah I mean it's that's a that's a new one you know and I could do that but also like I would I would feel so stupid for doing that even though like it it actually it makes no difference like it makes it's the same as someone who makes like like, you know how most people fucking make, you know, 80K a year and they have 3K a month rent. And, like, they don't see that as, like, a terrible financial decision. But it is. And, so, like, it would be less dumb for me to do that, but I'd still feel weird about it for some reason. I don't know. Like, I think, like, oh, I could save an extra 10K a month mm-hmm. and, like, live in a still fucking sick apartment or condo or whatever. Mm-hmm. And, you know, but I don't know. I really have no idea. I need help, bro. <laughs> so it's a work in progress. Yeah. I need to see a therapist, <laughs> a money therapist. That's a, Oh, that's another thing, bro. Like, do you believe in therapy? No, I don't. Um, I've been through like three or four therapists. Um, not for any, like I didn't have any like real issues, but, um, I was, I think when I was, when I was living alone and I wasn't in Miami yet and COVID was like still in full swing, like I was just kind of like, there was, and, and I just had so many fucking changes in life that all happened. Like I broke up with my girl at the time. I moved out of my parents' house. I like was in a new phase of life all alone because like I only had a couple of friends and I wasn't really seeing them much because like they were working and I was kind of fucking off. I was just doing copywriting and I felt super alone. And so I was just talking, I was talking through it, trying to see like, is it me? Like, is something wrong with me? Or like, what's going on? And like, I just realized that all therapists are stupid. Like I, bro, like if you're, if you were really smart, you wouldn't be a therapist. Like I respect people that are therapists and I'm sure you guys are working hard, but it's like, like listen, like therapist, you make seventy k a year. <laughs> like, it sounds fucked up. It is what it is. You know what I mean? And so like, I I find it hard to like accept advice from someone who is, you know, like not even they don't even have a business. Mm-hmm. They don't even have a business. And if they do, like that's what they're that's what they're taking. Like you know what I mean? Like you're not successful. I went to therapy for like two or three months, and I thought it was the stupidest thing. Even when I was there, I only went there because so many people were like. Oh, if you're feeling down bad, go see a therapist. Yeah. But they have no relatability at all. No. They don't understand anything. No, they're just scholars. They they like they understand your brain on like a logical level, and there's a lot of things that don't require logic for you to figure it out. You have to like change your fucking mind. Yeah. It's different. Mm-hmm. Um, and like I've gotten way more out of like talking to people who, and by the way, there are a few people, like like I I had this mentor for a while who was like 70, and like he was retired when when he was 30 he had like a, a big eight figure real estate portfolio he was fucking chilling and he would take on like a couple people at a time just to like talk them through life and shit like that and he was helpful because he like he just had the perspective he was kind of like 75 year old mace where it's like yo relax like everything's gonna be fucking fine bro you'll figure it out mm-hmm. that's all i need to hear bro and i tell myself that now yeah and i feel like when you go to therapy too you're just talking about your problems all the time and the more you ruminate on your problems the more present they're going to be in your mind and that's yeah. not what you want. No, it's a literal fucking cancer. It's a literal loophole of just negative feedback. Yeah. And negative thoughts. The only thing you can do, and from my experience, to get out of some sort of like... Um, Your rut. Yeah, to get out of a rut is to focus on building positive momentum, building up small wins. Mm-hmm. And from there, you're able to just build more self-confidence and then start attacking life again. Yeah, get to work. That is the answer. Yeah. Every time I've felt down bad, it's usually because I'm stressed out or anxious because I haven't done what I need to do in business. Mm-hmm. The answer to that is fucking get to work, bro. Everybody who's watching this who is like, man, I got so many fucking money problems. All I can do is think about my money problems. It's like, dude, why are you thinking about your money problems? Get to fucking work. Pick a thing. Like, in, like start with 100 bucks and do crypto. Or you start with whatever and do copywriting. Like, I started with, I had $18 in my bank account when I started copywriting. Like, there's all these opportunities to make money. Like, how the fuck do you have money problems? Mm-hmm. What's wrong with you? Like get to work. Like there's nothing else you can do. Like whatever you think sitting there ruminating on your problems, like you said, will do for you. I promise you the best thing you can do is grind out 10 hours a day of doing something that's actually productive, moving you towards somewhere else. Or if like you're fat 
the best thing to do is stop fucking thinking about how fat you are trying to think about supplements like get your ass in the gym bro i've been fat i've mm-hmm. been broke i've been all these things that everyone's afraid of and i've gotten over it by doing the thing like there's nothing you can you can't think your way out of a bad situation you have to act i believe feeling anxious too is a good feeling because it's a, it's a sign your mind is telling you you need to be doing more yeah. you could be doing so much more than you're currently doing right now mm-hmm. so why are you sitting around not doing anything and whenever you do put yourself to work or put yourself in discomfort afterwards like oh now i feel better and guess what you're a level closer to where you want to be in life yeah anxiety is a privilege and you can take that in two ways you can take it in the way that you just said where it's like it's a privilege that you get to have this feeling where you get to do more or it's a privilege that you have the fucking time to sit around and be anxious you know like you know who doesn't have anxiety bro people who live in third world countries people who live in fucking rural peru Mm -hmm. like those people do not have anxiety they're fucking putting in 11 hours a day they got shit to do Mm -hmm. they don't even know like they would laugh at you and like this sounds like a this sounds like a cliche where it's like oh yeah like anxiety like you know what i mean like first world problems it fully is bro i I don't know anybody who is actually genuinely busy that is like anxious like let's use cam as an example cam's off camera but he's he's our, our video guy and cam works more hours and I'm awake and I've never seen you I was actually gonna write an email about you Cam I've never seen you fucking stressed like I've seen you stressed but I've never seen you like anxious or like like you're just always doing shit and like yeah you have stress but it's like you you handle it and like you just like you have infinite energy because like you have you need it it. yeah yeah you're on time you're on an uber you're in the you're on the fucking bike trying to get to the next gig you don't have time to think bro aside from all the depression bullshit <laughs> do you go out much like how do you balance your your work life and also your social circle going out i go out a lot yeah, yeah. um i think that's actually super important like that is part of like being busy for me like okay when i say busy like dude i love when my life is the way it is right now so my my this has been a great fucking week for me like Financially, we've done fine. You know what I mean? Like, we've made the money that I thought we were going to make. Um, I've been, like, putting in a solid eight-plus hours of, of, like, real needle-moving work every single day. I'm in the gym every day. I'm, like, getting active. I'm, like, walking around, sweating a little bit, getting sun. I go up on the rooftop and get some fucking sun. Try and get a little tan. And, um, and I go out and I, I try and go do shit. I try and meet more people. I try and talk to people. Um, like going out for dinner with the with the boys, or like, you know, going out with my girl, or uh, or like going out. Sometimes do like double dates, or we're going to the club, or something like that. We're celebrating something. Mm-hmm. I was just in Puerto Rico, just like took a little mini vacay over the weekend for Jimmy's birthday. Yeah. Um, this weekend, like tonight, we're going to UFC. Like just trying to like throw in random variety. Like the weekend after, like I'll be in LA. For, I'll be at Loud Club. You know what I mean? Got a little got a little table watching uh, <laughs> a little Pekka or something like that. <laughs> But, like, I just try and, like, fill every bucket. You know what I mean? And I feel like if my if my health bucket is full, my work bucket is full, and my, like, social life bucket is full, I just, like, I, that's the happiest I can be. Like, I have so much fucking energy every single day just because I know that, like, I'm doing everything. I'm having so much fun. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Making money, feeling good, looking good, like, seeing my people. Like, mm-hmm. that's all I want, bro. And I could do this every day for the rest of my life. Yeah, being well-rounded is the most important part because so many people are just focusing on one aspect, which is typically money. And mm-hmm. don't get me wrong, it's one of the most important things, especially if you are new to the space and you're trying to build something for yourself. Yeah. But you're at a place right now, uh, I like asking this question to online guys. Do you have any biohacking routines or morning routines or are you just do whatever, get some sun and do that? <laughs> I just took Saber subs for the first time today. You know what that is? Saber subs? Saber subs. It's like this testro- no. testosterone supplement. It hasn't, take juice itself. It hasn't worked yet. I should. I should just start fucking, you know, putting a needle in my bum. Yeah, I'll <laughs> give that a shot. <laughs> now, my morning routine is actually very chill. So I'll try and wake up around like 8, 8.15. Okay. No alarm. I haven't set an alarm and I don't know how long. Um, I'll usually, I'll fucking look at my phone for the first, you know, minute of the morning. Like check, you know, Twitter, check business stuff, check Slack, check. High rows, whatever I want to check, like see how business did overnight, see if we made any money in the morning before I was asleep because we have a closer who's on fucking UK time, so he's closing at like 6 a.m. Um, so I check all that stuff, um, see if anyone needs anything on my team or anything, and then um, I'll get up, make some coffee, um, and then like sit on the balcony out here and write an email, 
send that out and then my deep work starts and that like I don't know I, I usually have like 30 minutes in the morning to chill I just need sun first thing like I need to be out there mm-hmm. and I hate when it's cloudy I fucking hate when it's like rainy outside because yeah. I can't sit on the balcony and it's just like it just it, it's usually like a bad start to the day um, and like I shouldn't be so fragile to like have a terrible day if it's fucking raining outside because like sometimes it rains but like <laughs> it rains being, often down here I'm just being real no right now it's been beautiful every single day for how long? Minute. I think Sheesh. it rained yesterday, but like, or maybe the day before. But like, dude, it's been beautiful. Um, but yeah, it never so, rains in Scottsdale. Yeah, I know, but like, look at you—you're in a fucking desert. <laughs> like, I wouldn't want. <laughs> I love the desert. If anyone hasn't been there before, bro, you gotta first come out here as well, and then go out to somewhere in the desert too, just to see how you like it. Because everyone's liking different environments. I personally hate the humidity here. Really? Yeah, the dry heat though. Oh, sign me up. Yeah. Um, I don't know. The, the the humidity can get pretty bad. I've never like been in like a dry heat. Like, no, nah, I've never I've never been in Zona. So should I make a trip? About, yeah, yeah. What, what do you do down there? Well, I mean, all the like all my like friends are out there. We're so, all, do you go out? Like, do you go on boats? Is there water in? There's Arizona? no boats. Like, there's no. The closest lake is like 45 to an hour away. Mm. But we got the mountains and shit. Like, it's dope. We have oh, a pool cool. and shit. Yeah, like, the pool's cool. fine. But. Everything I need is like in a two to three mile radius. All my friends were here, or there, I should say. And going out, bro, it's it's, it's called Old Town. Uh, it's okay. in Scottsdale. Right. That's basically where all the clubs are. So it's like a strip. Is that near ASU? No. ASU is around like 30, 45 minutes away from me. Okay. But Old Town is where everybody goes for the club scene, bars, uh, all that stuff. I live a little bit more north of that where it's more chill. And if I want to go and partake in the degeneracy, it's like a 20 minute drive. So I was supposed to move down here actually. I was coming here for, for six months straight for like a week at a time. Mm-hmm. Back in uh, November of 2022, or excuse me, actually before that, through the beginning of 2023. And, and then I actually went to Scottsdale for a friend's birthday mm-hmm. and I met everybody out there. I was like, good people, humble people, chill environment. And it just made sense for me to pick there over here. But yeah. I, I still love Miami. Yeah, I, Miami just has more of a, more of like I I I've heard that Scottsdale's, um, there's less upward mobility, where it's like there's money there, but it's not like Miami money. Like I look at some of these places, like maybe not in Brickell, because Brickell's pretty like new money, like not like anything crazy expensive, but like, you'll you'll see billionaires wandering around. Um, there's like a you, shit ton of money can, in Scottsdale. You can, but I mean, what's the most you've ever spent at the club? I mean, I don't be spending at the club, bro. Yeah, because you're in Scottsdale. In Miami, like we, I've had a couple nights where it's been over 20k and it's always been worth it. Like just like, like really good food, really high quality, like club. Like it's just a different. It's, I feel like I would compare Scottsdale more, and not that I've been there, but from what I've heard, Scottsdale to Tampa, where it's fuck like no, no, hell no, Tampa boring as shit. It is boring as fuck. Scottsdale's not boring. I mean, you can vouch. <laughs> Really? Mm-hmm. It'd be a great time too, because the grills there are and I'm from fire too. Okay. Well, all right, we'll we'll call it a day there. We'll do a helicopter ride sometime from hell yeah. wherever the hell we decide to. But Mason, I appreciate you coming on, bro. Thanks, man. And uh, where can the people find you at? It's at Cardinal Mason everywhere except for Instagram, because Instagram for some reason won't give me Cardinal Mason. So it's Cardinal Mace, M A S E. And on there, you can DM me if you want to know more about copywriting or anything that I do, and we'll help you out. Cool, cool. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed this one. And of course, as I always say, don't be motivated, stay disciplined, and I'll see you in the next video. Yeah. Hell yeah. I like that.